Tonight, we are going to continue this study that we began a couple weeks ago uh, on the Protestant denominations. Now, that word Protestant is important. Because when you look at the big pie of Christianity, you really should divide it in thirds. There's Roman Catholicism, there's the Orthodox Church, and then there's Protestantism. And we are in that great stream of Protestantism. And I selected the five, not necessarily the most significant denominations, period, in Protestantism, but I selected the five most significant ones we as Evangelical Baptists in Charlotte, North Carolina, the ones we would be most familiar with, the ones that a great many of you have come from. We began the study three weeks ago by looking at, well, of course, the Baptists themselves, that great stream of Protestantism from which we come. Last week, we were supposed to study Presbyterianism, but due to that crazy storm that came through campus the week before, we had to postpone the Awana celebration to last week, so we're pushing everything up. Now, tonight, I'm actually not going to address Presbyterianism. Here's why. I'm out of town next week, and Pastor Steve Adams, who I'm having teach for me next week, he said, hey, do you mind if I teach Presbyterianism? I kind of gave him his choice. He wanted to choose that one. So he's going to teach it next week. Tonight, I'm going to look at Methodism, and then in two weeks, I'll conclude our study with Pentecostalism. Now, if you had been looking at the poster, you're like, preacher, you forgot one. There was a fifth Lutheranism. Well, the, the truth of the matter is we will be out of time. The way our schedule is working, we lost a Wednesday, but I've already preached on Lutheranism. It's on YouTube. We'll email it to you. You can go watch it when you're really tired or when you need something to help you fall asleep at night. I got a nice 50-minute lesson for you on Lutheranism. We're going to study tonight Methodism, and I recognize that for a great many of you, you're like, hey, I come from the Methodist church. I think I could probably tell you a thing or two about it. I hope tonight is edifying. I hope tonight is charitable. And I hope tonight maybe we'll teach you something you maybe hadn't heard before about the subject. I, in other words, I hope this will be a soul-stirring, edifying night for you. So why don't you join me as we pray? Let's ask God to help us. And then we'll pursue our study of Methodism. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for these brothers and sisters, and I pray that you would use me to speak that which is edifying, faith-strengthening, soul-stirring. So by your Spirit's power, I pray that you would use me for your glory, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word Methodist? Probably your inextricably having your mind go to the most famous Methodists of all time. Who are they? John and Charles Wesley. I mean, that's where Methodism originates. Maybe you're familiar with some presidents. There are some famous politicians that are well-known associated with Methodism. By my count, there were five U.S. presidents, the most recent of which, George W. Bush, famously was a Methodist. In fact, his library is on the campus of SMU, Southern Methodist University in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Hillary Clinton famously was a Methodist, and she would make her Methodism a key part of her 2016 campaign. Even Vice President Dick Cheney was one. So maybe you're familiar with some of those names, or you may not have known that people like Beyonce or Rush Limbaugh, for example, have an association. I don't, I don't presume them to be devout Methodists, but they have some sort of loose association with it. Maybe your mind goes to people, or, or maybe you're thinking of places. Maybe you're familiar with some Methodist colleges, Wofford College, et cetera, but you know what's really interesting? Do you want to know what the most famous Methodist college is in the United States? The one you probably had no clue it was related to the Methodists. And it's not Asbury, though that would probably be, in truth, the most famous when you actually associate it with Methodism in the name. But the most prominent college in the U.S. that has a Methodist background is Duke University. Did you know that? Or Emory University. There is, in other words, a pretty significant Methodist influence throughout the United States. Some of you didn't realize that you've been singing Methodist songs. They've been coming right off your lips and you had no clue that you were singing something that a famous Methodist wrote, like the famed chorus we sing most Easter Sundays, Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. That was almost like speaking in tongues there, forgive me. That was written by Charles Wesley. Or uh, And Can It Be, or uh, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, all written by Charles Wesley, the most famous of the Methodist hymn writers. Tonight, what I want to do is I want to try to make sense of Methodism. I want to tease out, as I have before, their backstory. Let's look at their history. Then let's look at some 
sources of authority? What are those distinctive texts that they look at other than the Bible? And then we'll conclude our study with some very distinctive beliefs they have. Recognizing that this is a denomination, not a cult. That they're going to agree with us on almost everything, but there are some distinct differences. I hope to tease those out tonight. But I think the most interesting part of our study will be the study of the history of Methodism itself. So let's begin at the beginning. Where did Methodism come from? Well, interestingly, if you can recall with me a couple weeks ago, Methodism arose in the same place the Baptists arose, but there was a distinct difference. Do you remember with me what happened in the United Kingdom, in the nation of England, in the Reformation? Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation spread up to England, and they started to like it, except the king, he was still a Catholic, and he was trying to make sure Catholicism was still the main religion of the land until one day King Henry VIII decided that he wanted to marry another woman because he was tired of his wife. She wasn't giving him the kid he wanted, so he's going to trade her in. And the pope said, you can't do that. You're not allowed to divorce. And the king is not accustomed to being told no, so he said, well, you know what? Nobody tells me no. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to kick the pope out, and I'm going to set up my own church. So he started his own church. And it has the most ingenious name. This man was a creative marketing genius. Do you want to know what they called their church? He called it the Church of England. <laughs> what a name. We call it often today the Anglican Church from that word Anglo, which means one from England. It's that Anglo-Saxon. The Anglican Church or the Church of England. He sets it up. Well, here's the problem with the Anglican Church or with the Church of England. It feels like a great Reformation movement. It feels like a huge change from Catholicism. But the sad, candid truth is, it's kind of like diet Catholicism. Catholic zero, Catholic light. It's pretty much just like Catholic with just a few differences. It still has a lot of the same bells and smells and whistles. It really wasn't that much different. So there was a group within the Church of England that said, we got to fix this. This isn't reformed enough. It's not purified enough. We got to purify this more. We got to get this new church further away from the Catholic church. We need to reclaim the gospel. So there was one group, the Baptists, that said, you know what? We just got to split and do our own thing. And we studied that a couple weeks ago. But there was another group that tried to reform from within. There was a group that said, you know what? We are ministers of the Anglican church and we need to figure out how to become a more holy gospel-centered people from within. And this group became ultimately known as the Methodists. Who are they? Where'd they get the name? It began with two Anglican ministers, two men that were brothers, John and Charles Wesley. They were born to parents that had had 18 or 19 kids. They were like number 15 and number 18 in the bunch. And they were raised in a pretty strict, austere home. And they ended up becoming ministers in the Church of England. They actually went to Oxford University. Oxford University, as you surely well know, is composed of several colleges. And the most famous college of Oxford University to this very day, it has a confusing name. I'm going to tell you the name and you're going to think, well, I didn't know that was a college. The most famous college of Oxford University is called Christ Church, which sounds a whole lot like a church, doesn't it? But that's actually the name of a college. And they went to this college and they studied. And as they were there studying, they realized, you know what? This Church of England, it's kind of, it's all in the head and it's all ritual, but there's not a lot of spiritual uh, livelihood, vibrancy. We're not really pursuing holiness, so they began to meet together. John and Charles and a couple other buddies begin to circle up, and they start this little club where they meet, met together on a daily basis. And they, from 6 to 9 a.m., would start reading the Greek New Testament, praying, memorizing things, sharing the gospel. They were trying to hold one another accountable to grow in grace. They actually became mockingly known by those on campus as the holy club. And they didn't mean that as a compliment. They meant it as a pejorative insult. Yeah, you guys are just a bunch of holy men, this holy club. They began meeting and really growing. They started to develop, <clears throat> hit, hit, nudge, nudge. They started to develop a method of spiritual growth. And they became famous for this method of walking with Jesus. And they got uh, assigned a new mocking name. It was no longer called the Holy Club. Folks started to call them the Methodists. 
for this method of holy living that they began to cultivate, John and Charles Wesley. They begin this movement within the Church of England at Christ Church Oxford called the Holy Club. Well, eventually they went off on mission. They graduated and they were going to go to the new world where the heathens needed the gospel. So Wesley brothers go on a boat and they're sailing the ocean blue. And do you want to know where they're headed? Savannah, Georgia. And on their way to Savannah, Georgia, as is often the case in transatlantic travel, a huge storm comes. And as, can you just imagine, like have you ever been on one of our wonderful vessels today, like a cruise ship and a storm comes and it can make you a little nervous? Imagine being on one of those rickety boats a few hundred years ago in the middle of the ocean. They're sailing across the ocean with a bunch of other Christians called Moravians. And the Moravians, it's a long story, but they're out of Central Europe. And all of a sudden the storm hits and the boat is in trouble. The mast breaks. They're scared as they rightly should be, but they notice something. In great fear and panic, they notice that there was a group of Christians on this boat, the Moravians, who were strangely at peace, who were calm. Like Paul and Silas singing praises to God in jail in Acts 16, they too saw these Moravians singing praises to God in the midst of this storm, and it struck them. And they began to wonder, are we real? Why don't we have this sort of security? They land in Savannah. They start doing ministry. In fact, if you go to Savannah, Georgia to this day, any of y'all been to Savannah? You'll see several sites dedicated to the Wesley brothers. There's statues and there's points of interest in parks where they had done their ministry. But they realized, we're not sure we're real. It doesn't feel like we're actually truly holy. We've been trying to make ourselves holy with all these spiritual acts, but we don't have the same trust in God that these Moravians did. So they ended up going back to England. And when they came back to England, they found their way into this little Moravian gathering on a street called Aldersgate, which is a road you can find today. Folks, are you familiar with the Aldersgate uh, retirement community that's I don't know, like a mile or two from here. That's a Methodist retirement home. And that is named after what happened at this little Moravian meeting house on a street called Aldersgate. They, John comes into this little meeting house where these people are worshiping. And one of these Moravian leaders walks up and strangely, he reads something you wouldn't expect. It's reported that this Moravian leader in this moment took out the preface that Martin Luther wrote to his commentary on the book of Romans. So if you go read this, I have this in my library upstairs. It's a wonderful book that Martin Luther wrote many years ago on all of his thoughts on the book of Romans. And he writes a famous preface. And in this preface, as they began to read, I want to, rec- write, I want to read for you what transpired. This is from the firsthand account of this meeting. It reads, in the evening, I, John Wesley, I went very unwillingly to a society on Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. And about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. That phrase, I felt my heart strangely warmed, is one of the most famous things John Wesley ever said. Those were his words describing his conversion. He said, I felt that I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for my salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and he had saved me from the law of sin and death. In other words, John Wesley reported at that moment, God came and saved him. He has this powerful conversion experience after having been a missionary to Savannah and after having been the Holy Club Methodist leader at Christ Church Oxford. He was after all that, he reports, that God likely saved him on this Aldersgate Street. And his brother Charles, it's reported, had a similar conversion story just a couple days later. And so it was this newfound conversion, which by the way, this is a common story. I can't tell you how many times I have known or met believers who walked for years as active churchgoers, moral people, very involved, and have a conversion experience far later in life after all those wonderful things, and it's disorienting for everybody else who knew them. 
but they knew, guys, I, I wasn't necessarily purposely trying to fake it, but that wasn't real. And I have a newfound, it's as if my eyes were blind and now I see. I, 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 I know I'm saved now. That's what the Wesleys experienced. And so from that point forward, everything about their ministry changed. There were three things in particular I want you to note that began to radically be demonstrated in their newfound Methodist ministry. The first one was this. You started to note John Wesley innovating something that the world hadn't seen much of before. He started to practice what's called open air preaching. Now, open air preaching was not a common thing in England. If you're familiar with English society in that day and time, just kind of think of like, and this is much later, but think Downton Abbey. That's kind of how a lot of English culture was, that stiff upper lip. You don't do that sort of crazy stuff outside. Churches were a very austere setting. You would go and there would be a stately pastor who would give his little homily and the church would sit there quietly and just listen. Well, John Wesley, he upended all that. He started to go out where the people were. He started to go in the highways and byways out in the open and would began to proclaim the gospel. And he didn't just do this on Fridays. He didn't just do this on the side. It's reported that he would ride 20 thousand miles a year on horseback. Can you imagine spending 20,000 miles a year on the back of a horse? It is reported that he preached 800 sermons a year. Now I want you all to do the math. Just take our senior pastor, Clint Presley, who preaches 50, he probably, of the 52 Sundays, he probably preaches 46 of them would be my guess. That's 46 sermons. Let's just double it because of Wednesday night. So roughly 100 in total. Let's just be real generous and say 150. There's all these sermons we don't know about. He was preaching 800. This is insane. Uh, what was this guy doing? Here's, here's where it makes sense. It says on a typical day, he'd get up at 4 a.m., and he'd preach a message at 5 a.m. I don't know what sorry soul was listening to him at 5 a.m. And then he'd get on the road and do his next one at 6 a.m. And so on and so forth. This man was a beast. He was an animal. He began this open air preaching that instantly made Methodism begin to spread like wildfire throughout England and eventually into the States. Here's another thing that began to happen. After this conversion, not only do you see Wesley's open air preaching, you see his little brother Charles start to innovate something that has uh, really been influential to this day. In fact, probably the principal influence of Methodism today in the broader Christian church is felt through Charles's hymn writing. Charles began to write a bunch of hymns. Now you want to know how many hymns he wrote? Jackie, you won't believe this being our music secretary. He wrote 6,500 of them. Can you imagine? 6,000? I don't think I've sung 6,500 songs in my life. This man was prolific. He wrote, in addition to the songs I already mentioned, you remember, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Christ the Lord has Risen Today. He also wrote, uh, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Y'all know that song? Or Arise, My Soul, Arise. This man, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. These were all Charles Wesley's famed hymns. You see John with his open air preaching. You see Charles with his hymn writing. There was a third innovation that you may have had no clue was tied to Methodism. Did you realize that the whole concept of Christian small groups has its origination in Methodism? That's not to suggest that Christians never met in a small group in some way, shape, or form before that. What I do mean is it was never a widespread taught practice in recorded church history until the Methodists began to innovate it as a way to organize discipleship. Here's why. For example, another famous Methodist preacher of that era was a man named George Whitfield. Y'all ever heard the name George Whitfield? George Whitfield is considered one of the most gifted preachers, orators of American history. George Whitfield and John Wesley were both evangelists going and spreading the gospel, but there was a stark difference. George Whitfield had the Billy Graham effect. Very gifted, would go from town to town, do great large revivals, but then move on to the next town. John Wesley recognized, which by the way, in, in credit to Billy Graham, Billy Graham recognized this too, and he actually organized through local churches to accomplish what I'm about to tell you. John Wesley recognized that there were a lot of people getting saved, but nobody was being discipled. And they had to figure out how to organize these people to get them discipled. So he began to organize these small groups to help these baby Christians grow in their faith. That was actually an innovation, an innovation of the Methodist movement. 
Now, how did that Methodism that started in London, how did it make its way over here to the great U.S. of A.? You got to remember, John Wesley and Charles Wesley, though they were in Savannah, they weren't any longer. They came back home. How did it get back? Well, that's because they, along with George Whitfield, ended up returning to the United States. They come back to Savannah where they begin their ministry anew. And remember, they've got a new and revived ministry. And they're bringing this innovative outdoor preaching style. They're bringing their hymns. They're bringing their small groups. And here they go. In fact, they rode on horseback from New York City to Charleston, which is the longest recorded horseback ride evidently in U.S. history. I don't know if that's true or not. It's just what the history books uh, that I read mention. Pretty wild. And when he returns, it's estimated that 20 to 30,000 people met them when they arrived. Their names had gotten around. Do you want to know who one of their fans was? You're going to be shocked when I tell you this. Do you want to know the very famous American of this day and time who was not a Christian, didn't believe a word they said, but really liked listening to him preach. Y'all ever heard of Benjamin Franklin? Ben Franklin was a big fan of George Whitfield. Didn't believe a word of it, but he loved listening to him. It's reported by him that he did this little math study. He was listening to George Whitfield preach and began to backpedal, and he counted how far he had to backpedal till he could no longer hear him. And once he got to that place where he thought he could no longer hear him, he did a little math equation to figure out the square feet of the space where he could be heard. And then he estimated how many people could fit in those square feet. And his estimate was that 30,000 people could hear George Whitfield preach without a microphone. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't know if he was good at math or not. But it was a testimony to his unusual ability to communicate. It was reported that George Whitfield was such an eloquent orator that he would cause masses, grown men and women, to weep just uttering the word Mesopotamia. (laughs) Can you imagine? I wish I had that gift. I wish I could have you all be like, oh, preacher, if I just said Mesopotamia. (laughs) He had an unusual eloquence, and Benjamin Franklin thought it was something. In fact, Let me note what Benjamin Franklin wrote. After listening to one of his sermons, Benjamin Franklin is recorded to say this about the town. He said, change soon made its way in the manner of all the inhabitants of the town. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world was starting to grow religious. It was such that it felt like nobody could walk through the town in the evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. That's Benjamin Franklin writing about the influence of these Methodist preachers coming in to town. Now, you got to remember, there's actually at this point in time, no such thing as the Methodist church. Because do you all remember who John and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield are? They're not Methodist preachers. They're Anglican preachers. They're ministers of the Church of England that just have a more spiritual bent than most of the others. So you're thinking, well, preacher, then how, where did the Methodists come from? Because the Methodists today have really nothing to do with the Church of England. Where did the split happen? Well, I'll tell you where the split happened. I want you to imagine with me. Imagine being a minister of the Church of <clears throat> England in the late 1700s in the United States. Why would that be a problem in the great U.S. of A. around 1776? Because nobody particularly liked the head of the Church of England in the United States in 1776, who happened to be the king himself. And so there began to be a little bit of an issue. And it rose to a head when John Wesley realized he needed some more pastors, some more bishops, and he wanted to ordain them. But the Church of England over in London said, nope, we're not going to let you because they didn't like the Americans and all of their revolutionary tendencies. And so eventually he's like, you know what? then we're going to split and start our own thing. And he starts formally a split church from the Church of England. And its first name is actually not the Methodist Church. It's close. The first name is called the Methodist Episcopal Church, which Episcopal is the type of church government that the Church of England practices. That's where they got the name. The Methodist Episcopal Church was the first Methodist denomination, in essence, that split from the Church of England. And it split because 
of the American Revolutionary War. Now it began to spread throughout the United States, and it spread under two names that you may or may not be familiar with. If you have a Methodist background, you'll be familiar with this. If you don't, you may not. Anybody ever heard the names Thomas Koch or Francis Asbury? They are the two famed Methodists who helped spread Methodism in the United States after George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers. You may be familiar with Thomas Koch by the website named after him. Have you ever seen the website Cokesbury.com? It's kind of like the Methodist Lifeway. You can go buy a bunch of books there. Or Francis Asbury, Asbury College and University is named after him, which made a lot of headlines about a year ago when that revival of sorts broke out on that undergraduate campus. I think it was like February of 2023 or so. That was Asbury College. That's named after Francis Asbury. They became the first bishops of this new church. Now, Today, there's not just one Methodist denomination. In fact, I don't think any of you have probably ever heard of the denomination Methodist Episcopal Church. What happened to it? Well, as is so often the case, it began to split and splinter. And I want to briefly detail all the ways it began to break into pieces. Well, on the one hand, it began to split over church government. They began to argue over how are we supposed to organize this church? And there was one denomination that you're surely familiar with that split over wanting a more congregational form of government. And this was called the United Methodist Church. Y'all ever heard of the UMC, United Methodist Church? We're going to come back to that in a moment. Just put a bookmark right there. There was another issue that arose. This was the issue that arose in the United States in the 1800s and split a lot of denominations. It was the horrific issue of human enslavement, of slavery. And it split the Methodist church. This is where you meet the denomination called the AME, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Have you ever heard of the AME Zion Church? Y'all notice there's a lot of them in Charlotte. Do you know why that's the case? Because the AME Zion Church is headquartered in Charlotte. If you drive down Sugar Creek Road, uh, north of 85 and south of Harris Boulevard, it's kind of a back road area, the headquarters to the AME Zion Church is found on that little stretch of the road. This were, these were predominantly African-American Methodist uh, denominations that split from some of the racist tendencies that were happening with a lot of the white um, uh, Methodist leaders of the day. Then a third issue came and split the denominations all the more, and that was the issue of LGBTQ. This actually brings us up to today. Did you guys rec realize that the largest split in the history of American Protestantism happened just last year? The largest ever. Larger than anything that's ever happened in our history just happened last year. And it happened with the United Methodist Church. I live in North Charlotte. If you were to look at 485 as a clock, I live at 12 o'clock noon, right there at the top. And so I live near a little road called Asbury Chapel Road, named after this guy, incidentally. And if you drive up Asbury Chapel Road, it's kind of a beautiful back road to avoid the chaos of 77, if you've got to go up to Huntersville. I take it a lot. There's a Methodist church there. I drove by it two weeks ago, three weeks ago. And as I drove by it, it had a sign that used to read United Methodist Church, but the word United had gotten ripped off the front, and it just said Methodist Church. And I was like, ah, I see what's going on here, because guess what happened? The United Methodist Church had begun to liberalize, and a significant portion of the denomination began to think that we should not only affirm homosexuality, we should ordain non-celibate practicing homosexuals as clergy. In other words, this is a non-moral issue. They believe that God was perfectly okay with it. Well, there was a group within the Methodist church that said, this is wrong. You can't do this. This is against God's word. And it reached ahead just this past year when they did a big vote that essentially split them. In fact, the split, I think, actually formally happened just a couple months ago. I think it was in 2024 that it formally split. And now the UMC, the United Methodist Church, it is considered the more liberal or LGBTQ affirming wing of the Methodist church. And there was a new one that's more conservative and has a similar view of human sexuality as we would as Baptists. And that denomination is now called the Global Methodist Church. 
La uh, two days ago, Lauren and I were driving up Asbury Chapel Road again. And as we drove by that church, guess what? They had a new sign. They had replaced that scratched out United Methodist Church sign with a brand new sign that says Global Methodist Church. They are part of this new denomination that is formed over what they believe is a biblical sexual ethic. Therein lies kind of the backstory of the Methodist Church. Now, a few things, I'm going to move very quickly through this because honestly, it's not altogether interesting. There are four documents. If you're really interested and you're like, I want to know more about these Methodists, one thing you should note is there are four main sources that Methodists will go to, Methodist pastors, scholars in particular, will go to as kind of authoritative documents that really guide, govern their belief. One is John Wesley's, you're going to notice a pattern here, all of this has to do with John Wesley. One of it involves John Wesley's doctrinal minutes, which is basically a bunch of his doctrinal views on things. Then a lot of his sermons, there are about 138 that you can read today that people look to for guidance. He actually wrote his own little study Bible. It's called the Explanatory Notes Upon the New Testament. He wrote this. And then he actually took the Articles of Faith of the Church of England and edited them. He eliminated 14 of them. He revised 25 of them. And so he kind of has his own version of this that the Methodist Church looks to. But that's just for those of you that are really curious about it. For the majority of us, I think what will be of greatest interest are these final few items. What distinguishes the Methodists? And if you all are really well behaved, I'll do a miracle and get you out earlier than 730. We've got no wanted to wait on. There's four things of many that I could delineate. There's four distinctives. Some of you, even as Methodists, may be surprised by a couple of them. As former Methodists, I should say. One distinctive that has really separated Methodism from, for example, Baptistic practice is they have a distinct view on how they govern themselves as a church. So, for example, let's review. When you consider how is a church supposed to govern itself, there are a few views. There's really three main ones that we've thought about, and the Methodists created a fourth one. The first view is what we practice. It's called congregationalism. Congregationalism is the view that the congregation gets to vote or self-govern. So, for example, here at Hickory Grove, when the day comes for Clint Presley to retire, guess what? Nashville, where the Southern Baptist Convention is headquartered, will not send us a new pastor. They don't have any say. Do you know who will choose the new pastor? The church, the congregation. That's called congregationalism. They vote on their own things. There's a different view. There's a view called Presbyterianism, which is where the Presbyterian denomination gets its name. And that's the view that the presbyteros, which is a Greek word for the elders or the rulers of the church, there's a small group of godly men that make most of the decisions for the church. That's a view that the church is governed not by the whole congregation, but by just a few uh, elders. That's Presbyterianism. There's another view that you see in the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church and the Church of England. It's called the Episcopal government. What's the difference between everything we've studied and this? It's the very hierarchical, top-down approach. Y'all remember the Catholic Church? If the Catholic Church has a debate in Sunday school, they go ask their pastor. If the pastor doesn't know, he goes and asks his bishop. If the bishop doesn't know, he goes and asks his archbishop. If the archbishop doesn't know, he calls a cardinal. If the cardinal doesn't know, he goes to the great man who is going to solve all of the debates. Where does the buck stop? With the papa himself, the pope. That's called Episcopal government. It starts at the top and works down. Well, which form of church government would you have expected the Methodist church to have adopted? Not the congregational, because they ain't Baptists. Not the Presbyterians, because they ain't Presbyterians. They adopted the Episcopal government because they came from the Church of England. They really liked that. But then they realized there are some problems here. And so they began to do a hybrid approach. It's like a mix between, uh, between Episcopal government and congregational government. And it's a new word called connectionalism. Connectionalism is a kind of a weird concept, but it's this form of government where it's like each church is kind of governing itself, but then they also are so interconnected that there is some accountability one to another. So for example, perhaps you're familiar that in the Methodist church, it's not uncommon for a pastor to be moved. 
Y'all ever had an experience where a pastor's there for five to seven years and then he gets moved by whatever governing board exists and he goes to another church? That's part of their connectional approach to church government. That's one of their interesting features. They did that as an effort to hold one another accountable and not be too lone ranger like the Baptists are. There are other reasons. I'm just not going to dive deep into them. I think it will bore most of us. But just know that how they govern is a key distinctive of theirs. It's not the only key distinctive, though. Not only do they debate how we should be governed. Another distinctive of the Methodists is how God saves a person. So Methodists are pretty famous for a view of the Bible. When you read the Bible and you're trying to figure out what does the Bible teach about the way God saves you, they're fa pretty famous for generally speaking having this particular view. Some people call it an Arminian perspective. And that perspective, Arminian comes from a man named Jacob Arminius who lived many, many years ago in the 1600s. We'll, we'll spare that history. Let me just summarize it this way. It's this belief that the way God saves you is pretty libertarian. It's, it's, it accords with lived experience as a citizen of the free country of the United States. So for example, they, they would teach that essentially God made it possible for anybody and everybody to accept or reject Christ because when he died on the cross, a thing that they, the theologians of Methodism will call prevenient grace was shed. Now, prevenient is a word we don't use. It means grace that comes before. It was a grace that God gave everybody. Now, why did people need that grace in advance? Because the Bible teaches we're dead in sin. And if you're dead in sin, dead people don't choose things. Dead people are just dead. They are going to do what they want, when they want, how they want. They're going to reject God. Well, they believe that Jesus died on the cross making this grace that came and helps dead people decide whether or not they're going to follow him or not. So they don't believe in total depravity. They believe in what you might call partial depravity. You, yeah, you're sinful and depraved, but God in his grace has made you not totally depraved. He's made it possible for you to have just enough lacking of depravity that you can decide whether or not you're going to do this or not. They also would argue with the Presbyterians, for example, and say, okay, well, we also believe that God chooses you when the Bible uses the word election he chose you before the foundation of the word world, they'd say that word is, is really not unconditional. It's conditional. He chooses you based off his foreknowledge that you were going to choose him. So it's kind of like the circular argument. They also believe in what's called unlimited atonement, uh, which is a view that when Jesus died on the cross, his blood was shed for anybody and everybody, which you're like, well, doesn't every Christian believe that? Well, to be clear, there's a contrary view called limited atonement, which is this understanding that when we talk about Jesus' blood being shed, what we should be talking about precisely is Jesus' blood did something. When it was shed, it saved people, and it clearly doesn't save everybody because there's a lot of people going to hell, the Bible teaches, so you have to speak with precision when you say that. That's what Presbyterians would say about that. The Arminians, the Methodists wouldn't say that. They'd say, no, 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 I don't think that's quite the case. They also would say God's grace can be resisted. You know, some people are going to receive it and a lot of people are just going to stiff arm it altogether. And the Presbyterians would say that God's grace is irresistible, that when God decides to save you, he is going to do it. And then they would also argue that you can lose your salvation, whereas uh, the Presbyterians would say, no, 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 you can't lose your salvation. When God saves you, you're always his. Now, I wonder how many of you are sitting here thinking, well, preacher, I'm a little confused now. I don't know even know where I fall on that. Because I agree with some of the Methodists, and I agree with some of the Bapt I mean, some of the uh, Presbyterians. I feel caught in the middle. If you feel that tension, if you're like, well, which is it? Welcome to being a Baptist. <laughs> Baptists are in this middle ground. The Baptist denomination is filled with people on both sides of this divide. This church has people on both sides of this divide. I believe genuine Christians can disagree on these matters as long as together we believe you are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that the offer of the gospel is to be made to every man, woman, and child in all creation. If you can agree on those core concepts, then you got the gospel. We're really just trying to figure out how this exercises itself in time and space. The Methodists, they tended to have this perspective. It actually ended up becoming known as Wesleyanism. Wesleyanism. 
Today, you actually might hear it be described as Wesleyan theology. That's a synonym for Arminian theology, as opposed to Calvinistic theology or a Reformed Presbyterian bent that you would see predominantly in the Presbyterian church. That's a distinctive of the Methodist church. It's, not, it's only distinctive because in the Baptist life, it's a mixed bag. There's people across the spectrum uh, everywhere. The Baptist church actually began pretty Calvinistic, and then it became more our uh, Wesleyan in the middle 20th century during the great revivals of a lot of the evangelists. And today, I don't know how to actually tabulate this, but like the Southern Baptist Convention as an example, it, it, could, it would probably be 50-50. Genuinely, there is that much disagreement within all the churches and seminaries on, on what do you do with this? But again, like I said, just as one of your pastors, I think it's a good conversation to have because it forces you to reckon with the Bible. What is the Bible telling us about how God saves a person? In my word, we can at least agree on this. Praise the Lord. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I'm not exactly sure how it worked itself out in time and space, but I know when that day comes, I stand before my maker, I'll throw my crown at his feet, and I will say it was all of grace, all of grace, all of grace. I will not be able to take one shred of credit, and I will look and plead that every lost sinner, every lost sheep would be found and would come home likewise. God saves by the gospel proclaimed, which is why we preach the gospel. That's a distinctive of the Methodist Church. How God saves. Another distinctive of the Methodist Church, and this is perhaps the most interesting, unique distinctive. This is what clearly separates them from Baptists. And this is their view, not merely of how God saves, but how God sanctifies. Y'all know what that word means, right? To be sanctified is to be changed. Remember, when God saves you, he changes you. God doesn't just save you and then let you live like the hellbound sinner you were the rest of your life. He begins a work in you. And if you're truly saved, you're going to start being slowly but surely changed into the image of Jesus. Some of us slower than others, but we're getting changed into Jesus' image. The biblical word the Bible uses is you're being set apart or sanctified. Now, here's what's interesting. A distinct belief in Methodism that originated with John Wesley was the view, and I just think this is kind of crazy, candidly. It's the view that you can become fully, perfectly, or completely sanctified this side of heaven. Now, folks, before I explain what they mean by that, let's just take a step back and say, that is a really interesting position. Because I wonder how many of you are like, preacher, I'm almost there. <laughs> Guys, I mean, here's the truth. I've walked with Jesus for 20 years. And the truth of the matter is, with every successive year I walk with the Lord, before the Lord, I mean this, I actually feel less holy, not more holy. And that's not because I don't care. It's actually the opposite. It means with every passing year I grow to know the Lord, I grow to know two things. God is infinitely holy and I am infinitely not. I start to see that chasm all the more. And it makes me have awe and wonder for the goodness of the gospel of Jesus. That he saved a wicked wretch like me. I don't feel holier. I actually see my sin all the more. There's a unique belief that you could actually become perfectly sanctified this side of eternity. It's often described as Christian perfectionism. And this is a belief that originates with Methodism. Now, let me be fair. I don't want to make a caricature here. I want to tell you what they mean and what they don't mean. Here's what they do mean. Oh, well, here's what they don't mean. Let's start with what they don't. That'll help. What they don't mean by this belief is they don't believe that you could become completely free from ignorance, mistakes, infirmities, or temptations. They're not teaching that. That would be kind of nuts. What they do teach is that it's possible for you to be freely completely freed from slavery to sin and evil thoughts. Which is an interesting way to describe it. Because in one sense, the Bible says that when Christ saves you, he changes you such that you are no longer a slave to sin. You're a slave to Christ. You're like, okay, well, I, can, I would get that. Like, I'm able to change. But they'll take it a step further and say that there's a possibility to be sanctified such that you would no longer really wrestle in any degree, shape, or form with any evil inclinations, that 
sin would not have the allure it have? Would temptations exist? Sure, in the same way that Jesus had temptations, but there really wouldn't be this waging battle with sin. And folks, a lot of you have been walking with the Lord a lot longer than me, so you can speak from experience. Some of you have been walking with the Lord longer than I've been alive. And I'm trusting that your testimony would be, preacher, I'm still in the fight. And it's not going to finish till the day I die. We are going to wage this war with sin, wage the war with faith, fight the good fight of faith until the day we cross the finish line. They have this interesting belief that you could actually be freed from that. And they base it off texts like, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And they'll say, well, if that's possible, then I guess we must be able to do that. This view actually had an interesting uh, influence. It spurred a movement within Christianity in the 1800s that spilled over into the 1900s called the Holiness Movement. The Holiness Movement was this view that God gave you a first helping of grace when he saved you. And he gave you a second helping of grace when he completely sanctified you. When God saves you, you are a recipient of his grace. But when he fully sanctifies you a few days, few years, whatever later, you've now got a second blessing or helping of his grace. You've gotten double portion of his grace. You are now holy. And it spurred this movement within Christianity called the holiness movement. Do you know there's a lot of denominations today that you may have heard of that are rooted in the holiness movement, this movement that has this view, there's two helpings of God's grace. Any of you ever heard of the Church of the Nazarene? I grew up in Oklahoma City. They're everywhere. In fact, Southern Nazarene University is a significant institution in Oklahoma City that is a Nazarene school rooted in this holiness movement. Any of you all ever heard of the Salvation Army? It is rooted in the holiness movement. You ever heard of the Wesleyan Church? that it as a subset of Methodism is rooted in this holiness movement. It's all rooted in this belief that when God saves you, he changes you, but he could actually change you completely before you get to heaven. Now, folks, we don't believe that as Baptists. We believe that when God saves you, he does change you. You are being sanctified, but it is a slow, gradual process that will only reach its full fruition when you get to heaven. And we have a word for that. Do you want to know what the word we use to describe the moment you're perfectly sanctified? We call it glorification. When you finally get changed perfectly, when your faith becomes sight, when you are at last made whole before your Lord. That is a core distinct difference between us and the average Um, Methodist theological position. Just three distinctives. Let me give you one very brief fourth and final one, and then I'll try to keep my word and get you guys out just a few minutes early. A fourth distinctive would be their view of baptism. They do distinguish themselves a little bit on how they baptize. You got to remember, where did they come from? They came from the Church of England. What did the Church of England do? Well, they were Catholic zero, Catholic light. So diet Catholic, they practiced a lot of Catholic stuff. They were baptized babies, just like the Catholic Church. And so the Methodist Church began practicing this infant baptism practice as well. They viewed baptism as a sacrament, not an ordinance. Do y'all ever notice me and Clint, when we do the Lord's Supper, we often use the word ordinance? Ordinance means God ordained, Jesus ordained, we do this until he returns. So we practice baptism and the Lord's Supper as two ordinances. There's a different view called sacraments, which says that they are a means of grace. There's like a unique grace that comes to you when you partake of the Lord's Supper or you get baptized. And so they actually believed that baptism was a sacrament. If you baptized a baby, it gave them a unique divine grace that could bless them, so to speak, before they end up getting converted. Consequently, they weren't child abusers. They wouldn't take infant babies and submerge them under the water. That'd be pretty bad. So instead of immersing them like adults do in baptistic life, they would sprinkle or pour water on their heads. That's called effusion. They would just put the water over the top of their head. Perhaps you've been to some of those christening ceremonies uh, in the Methodist church or you've been a part of a christening in a Roman Catholic church where the same practice happens. That's a very clear distinction from the Baptist church which teaches that baptism is an ordinance reserved for believers and its mode is by immersion. 
We believe that you must profess faith in Jesus and then you demonstrate that through the visual act of being submerged under water. Just like Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose from the dead, so too our old nature has died. When Jesus saves us, it is buried and gone, dead no more. And Jesus alone raises us from the grave into a new person. If anybody is in Christ, the Bible says, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. A core distinctive of the Methodist church from, for example, the Baptist church. Folks, let me conclude with just one final appeal. My word to you is, I want you to know that the Methodist church by and large is wholly evangelical. You will find a church, some of you come from it, that is in lockstep with us on the gospel of God's grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone. This is a thoroughly evangelical church. As is the case in Baptist life, significant portions of the Methodist church have been corrupted with false liberal theology. Baptists have done the same thing. The United Methodist Church, which was a significant bastion of Methodism, has unfortunately peeled away, and it is now, I would say, apostate. It's not practicing the faith once for all delivered to the saints, although I'm sure there are some holdovers within the United Methodist Church that are orthodox. They're just trying to reform from within. But a significant portion has split off into this global Methodist Church. The big distinctions are that they just arose a little differently than the Baptists. The Baptists wanted to reform from the Church of England by splitting all together. The Methodists wanted to reform the Church of England by fixing it from within. And they tried, they failed, so they ended up splitting off on their own. They're more originated with two guys, unlike the Baptist Church, which doesn't really have a name we go to and talk about a lot. The, Pres uh, the Methodists have those names, the Wesleys, uh, for example. And they do have some distinctives. They're in particular, their distinct view on how God changes you, how he sanctifies you, that is a strange oddity that the mainstream Methodists would believe that would be in contradiction to the faith that we hold dear. But other than that, you're going to find a pretty broad general agreement. So I hope that was of service to you. Next week, y'all come back. Steve Adams will be here in my stead. He'll teach you on the history of Presbyterianism, which I really wish I could teach you. I enjoyed that study. It'll be an interesting study. I hope you're back for that. And then in two weeks, I'll be back here on the 5th of June where we will conclude our study with what I promise you will be the most interesting of them all. Folks, I am just going to straight pitch it to you. Pentecostalism is wild. Come back in a couple of weeks and learn the backstory on where did they come from. I think you will find that most fascinating. Would you join me as we pray? And then I'm going to let you out with eight minutes to spare, which I think is a record for me. So let me pray real quick so that I don't lose that record. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for these brothers and sisters, and I pray that this was an edifying, useful study. Lord, we thank you that you have saved us by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. We praise you that there are other brothers and sisters in Christ of other denominations like the Methodists who by and large share this faith once for all delivered to the saints. Lord, we long for that day until you return. Until that day comes, Lord, may we be found faithful and may we make much of your name, Jesus Christ, the name above all names. And it's in that name we pray. Amen.